Just a quick warning, I had to re-upload this video because apparently YouTube considers this word on the same level as the F word, and you can't say that within the first 7 seconds of the video. So without further ado, here we go. Wash your d**ks, the apocalypse is right around the corner with Black Mirror's final episode of Season 6. Demon 79 explores what would happen if you were haunted by the lead singer of Boney M, and in this video we'll be taking a deep dive into its ending, a ton of Black Mirror Easter eggs, and making sure to eat my lunch in a creepy basement. So come along with me and like and subscribe because my demon Susan Wajiki says that if I don't get at least 10 subscribers, this video will end. Oh, she's not the president anymore? Well, I guess there's nothing more British than living on top of a fish and chips shop. That's where we'll find our protagonist, Nita Huck, as Art Garfunkel's song Bright Eyes plays. This was a song originally written as the theme for the animated movie Watership Down, and the bright eyes refer to the rabbit's wide-eyed expression as it navigates a world filled with peril, just like our protagonist. The episode looks like it was filmed on Super 16, which would be common back in 1979 when the story takes place. Nita works in the footwear department of Possets, where she has to endure her racist co-worker Vicky and customers like Keith Hollinger, who gets a bit intimate with the footwear. And it's here Nita experiences the first of her hallucinations, bashing Vicky's head into the counter and strangling Keith. Just a typical day of work. It's pretty ironic then that we find her reading a book called Creative Visualization, which is all about using mental imagery to produce positive changes in one's life. If it can produce positive ones, can it also produce negative? But to really understand Nita's story, one must understand the political backdrop of 1979 Britain. Rising unemployment, high inflation, and industrial strikes made for a volatile situation, and some, like the National Front Party, used immigrants as a scapegoat for the country's problems. We'll see Vicky reading a National Front flyer which says, Stop Immigration, Protect British Culture, and Nita will have the letters NF spray-painted on her door by some local assholes. Outside of Possets, we get our first look at Michael Smart, a man running as the conservative candidate in Tipley. Smart's name can be found in a ton of articles in Episode 2's Locke Henry, and there's even a documentary about him on Streamberry found in Episode 1's Joan is Awful. We'll get to know a little bit more about Mr. Smart and his vision for Britain in a bit. But first, the episode's inciting incident. While being asked by her boss to eat in the basement due to a complaint by Vicky that her lunch smells, Nita uncovers a desk belonging to Posset's founder, Jeffrey Posset. It's said that in his last days, Posset holds himself up here, and it seems he became obsessed with local crimes. Nita uncovers several old articles, the first about a man dying in a fire, the second a man crushed by a wall, and the third a woman's sudden disappearance. Keep in mind this number three, as it becomes a recurring motif throughout the episode. Now, there is a brief mention of someone called Callow in a different article, but unsure if this has any relation to future Prime Minister Michael Callow from Season 1's The National Anthem. Things take a turn when Nita nicks her finger and blood drops on this odd-looking domino. A domino which will later be referred to as a talisman. It kind of looks like a fork with two prongs sticking from it. A dead ringer for the White Bear logo from Season 1. Season 2. For some reason, she ends up taking this talisman with her and, while at home, is greeted to the demon known as Gap, who says that the talisman anointed with her blood means they are now linked. She must sacrifice three humans over the next three days or the world will end, but in order for Gap to help her, she has to agree to it, and in an act of fear, she agrees. Gap is the name of a demon found in the Dictionnaire Infernal, and also a place where you can get some reasonably priced clothing. He's considered a prince of hell with the ability to change his shape and see into the past and future. In our story, he possesses these abilities, but isn't as high-ranking. In fact, he says that Nita is part of his initiation, and should she fail to murder three people, he'll be cast out into oblivion for all eternity. <laughs> no pressure. Later in the episode, while calling his superiors, he refers to himself as a misophase, which according to 10th century Eastern Byzantine religion, were one of the lowest class of demons. When Nita accepts Gap's help, notice what happens to the talisman. It has three lines instead of two, each line representing a murder she must commit, with a line disappearing every time she's successful. 
people. Does this mean then that the last person to possess this talisman only killed one person? And does it have anything to do with the newspaper articles Nita discovered? I have my own theory which I'll share in just a bit. To ease Nita's fears, Gap takes on a form a little more appealing than this and transforms into a singer from German Caribbean vocal group Boney M, something Nita had been watching the previous night. He shows her what will happen should she not kill three people. The world will be plunged into fire. As we'll find out later, this will manifest in a nuclear apocalypse between the US and Russia. Fearing the end of the world, Nita embarks on her quest to kill, only targeting people who deserve it her first victim being Tim Simon. Gap can show Nita what these evil people have done in the hopes of making her kills more justifiable. For example, Nita can see how Tim sexually abuses his daughter, making him a prime candidate to get whacked in the head with a brick. This becomes Nita's first kill, and a line from her talisman disappears. Alerted to the body is Detective Len Fisher, who we first see reading Jean Le Carré's spy novel Smiley's People, which came out in 1979 and coincidentally has dominoes on the front. He always seems to be one step behind Nita throughout her killing spree. Now Nita has to find victim number two, deciding to check out the local pub, the Three Crowns, there's three again, after opting against killing her co-worker. Vicky may be racist, but that's not enough for Nita to kill her. She's gonna Nita a bit more. <laughs> oh. Here she'll find Keith Hollinger, the absolute creep who hit on her at work and who's said to have gotten away with the murder of his wife. Something Gap confirms. This will be her next victim. Hmm. Stalking him back home, she's caught, but Keith thinks she's into him and invites her over for some sexy dancing. The interesting thing about Keith is that when Nita goes to kill him, he accepts it. This is what I deserve. And thus, Keith becomes Nita's second victim. But there's a problem. His flatmate and brother Chris has seen her. If Nita's going to prevent the apocalypse, she'll have to kill the witness, even if he's a completely innocent man. What ensues is a super awkward hammer and knife fight which sees Chris stabbed in the chest. Nita should be done her three kills, but a line still remains on the talisman. So Gap calls his superiors, using the number 666 no less, and finds out Keith's kill didn't count because murderers are ineligible. You'd think he'd have learned that in demon school. So Nita has to go back to work and think about who to kill next. That's when Michael Smart comes in. Nita asks Gap if he'd be a good candidate, but he knows his superiors wouldn't be happy if Nita killed him. Technically, his kill would count towards the three, but as we'll see when he shows Nita Michael Smart's future, this man is going to bring a lot of pain and hatred to the country. We get a glimpse of this when Michael asks who Vicky's gonna vote for. She wants the far-right National Front Party because they'll get those immigrants out of the country, but Michael tells her she'd just be throwing her vote away. The National Front has no chance of winning. Why not vote for him? And he basically tells her he's a racist in disguise. You know what I stand for. And this is backed up when Nita is shown Michael's future. We see a sign that Smart gets kicked out of the Tories for racist remarks, something that is also found in an article in Locke Henry. He starts a completely new party called Britannia, something he threatened to do in an article in Locke Henry as well. Even the Britannia party logo is in the shape of the white bear. In Michael Smart's Britain, people of color are surveilled. Houses are raided, immigrants struggle, there's viruses, fires, and even the symbols at his campaign rallies would make Goebbels blush. There's even even the use of those metal dogs from season 4's Metalhead, something we can see Michael Smart was to unveil in episode 2's Lock Henry. Len tracks down Nita after finding out she was also at the pub the night Keith was murdered. He has written proof that the two had met before, and it kind of makes her a suspect, but at this point he doesn't have any definitive proof. He lets her go and secretly follows her, soon realizing that Nita is also following Michael. I also found it really cheeky that Michael Smart listens to the Tannhauser over by Richard Wagner, a known anti-Semite. Nina does her best fast and furious, causing Michael's car to crash into a nearby tree, but unfortunately he's still alive and she has to finish the job. And I gotta say I love the satanic choral music when she goes in. But Len is there to stop her and Nita is quick to say sorry. But if you listen closely, she's apologizing to Gap. Because she was unsuccessful, he'll now have to spend eternity in oblivion. Or at least that's what we think will happen once the clock strikes 12. While being interrogated, the 
detectives go over her story, which sounds completely insane, and they reveal that the talisman has been a domino the whole time. As midnight hits, it looks like nothing has happened, but a short moment later, air raid sirens go off, and Britain is in the middle of a full-scale nuclear attack. If we're to believe what follows next happens, she accepts Gap's offer to come with her to oblivion, and humanity is plunged into an apocalypse. But I don't think that's what happened. I think it was all in her head. At the beginning of the episode, we're introduced to Nita's dead mother, who we'll later find out suffered from mental troubles. Nita even says she went mad. Could Nita also have inherited these traits? We know that she experiences hallucinations, such as throwing Vicky into the counter. This happened before her meeting with Gap, and it seems as though elements from her real life influence her hallucinations. For example, the articles in the department store basement refer to three deaths. They include fire and references to Mayday, the time in which her kills must be completed. Unfortunately, there's no date on those articles, but it's possible they could be from 1926, which is the year Gap said the talisman was created. Additionally, we have Gap himself who takes the form of Boney M, who Nita watched the night before. The apocalypse is likely a hallucination as well. We see Nita talking to the police, and then the camera cuts to the clock. But when we cut back, the detectives are completely outside of the room. It's only been a few seconds. There's no way they could have gotten out there in that amount of time and not have made a sound. It also makes sense that Nina would hallucinate the apocalypse as it would help justify her kills and compartmentalize her trauma. I think the real Nita is locked up somewhere in her own little world. We also know from Locke Henry that Michael Smart is alive and well, suggesting the apocalypse never happened. But we also know these Black Mirror episodes are just loosely related to one another. But I want to hear what you think. Did Nita end up with Gap in Oblivion, or is she spending the rest of her days in a psych ward? I want to hear your thoughts in the comments below. Thanks for watching, everyone. Please be sure to like and subscribe. And for more bad takes, you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at ThinkStoryYT. Until next time, remember... 